Are you all ready this morning? You got your seat belts on? Turn me down just a little bit back there. I thank God for the Spirit. I, I thank God, some of y'all may or may not believe it, but the Spirit in the traditional service is just as strong, but it seems like it's a different, it's different, but it's amazing to me. Both of them are just amazing to me. Question, have you ever, and I already know the answer to this, have you ever been to the point where you didn't think that God knew who you were or that God had forgotten who you are have you ever just felt abandoned by God this morning we're going to be looking at a couple of scriptures and y'all don't have to answer it I'll answer it for myself absolutely even in times where I felt closer to God. I felt like my life resembled more of Christ's life. And it seemed like the stronger that I got in Christ, the more of Mark that died, and the more of a relationship, strong relationship I had with God, it seems like in my life, looking back at it, it is that point that God dumped me and left me in whatever state I was in. This morning we're going to preach a little bit about some of the other people that felt along this same line. If you got your Bibles or it will be on the screen, Isaiah chapter 40 verses 25 through the rest of that chapter. This is God speaking with Isaiah. It says, To whom will you liken me? Or to whom shall be my equal? Says the Holy One. Lift your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out their host by number. He calls them all by name, by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one is missing. In other words, he knows every one of them. He calls us every one by our own name. He knows where we're at. He said, why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by God, my God. Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of all the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary, his understanding is unsearchable, he, he gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fail. But those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings of e like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Thus says the word of the Lord. Isaiah is talking about a time where God's talking about His creation, of everything that He created. And He's talking through Isaiah, and He's showing him everything of the greatness of God. But then He stops, God stops, and He says, Who do you think you are to say that I have, you say that I have overlooked you, I've overpassed you. In other words, you don't matter to me anymore. And he goes on and he talks about, he said the young person will run and they will faint. Even though they've got all the strength of the youth, he said they'll get to a point they can't go anymore. And the strong will get to the point they can't pick up anymore. But he said it is me who strengthens the weak. It is me that gives knowledge to those who are weak-minded. He said it's me. He said through me, he said you can have strength to mount up as wings of eagles and soar to even to the highest places. I thought this morning as I look out throughout the Bible, the more Paul got into God's ministry, the worse Paul's life got. Paul was very close to God, and then God shipwrecked him a couple of times. Paul was doing God's work, and a viper come out of the fire and bit Paul on the hand, and they knew he was going to die. It's when Paul was doing some of the greatest work for God that they beat him and Silas and locked him in a prison. 
They beat them 39 times, almost 40 it means to kill a person, so they beat them 39 times and throw them into the innermost parts of the prison, locking them to one of the prison guards to where there was no way they could escape. But in the midst of this, Paul, one began to sing, and the other one began to pray, and the Bible said that the jail began to shake, and the doors began to open, and the chains fell off of them. I think about all the different ministers of God, even Stephen, a lay person, began to teach and to talk about the mysteries of God and the people got so tired of him that the Bible said they began to gnash him with teeth. The, 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 the studiers say that they really did bite him. In history, they bit him. And, and I've told you all this before. I don't know how mad you have to be to bite someone. I've been mad enough to choke them. But I've, up to this point, I've never bit anyone. Patsy's come at me a couple of times, but we was able to fend her off. But, but I, I thought to myself, when it seems like they're doing the greatest work of God, we find them just like Isaiah. God, you've done all this great and marvelous work. You, you parted the waters for these. You've done all of these great miracles throughout. But it seems like when I needed you the most, it seemed like it's there that you just abandoned me. You passed over me. That's hard to reconcile. When I was a younger man and running from the call to preach, God would press upon my heart. He said, I've called you to preach. And I would argue with God. And I'd say, God, no, I'm not preaching. I, I, that, that's something I'm not comfortable with. I don't want to do it. I'm not smart enough. The whole nine yards. And God would continue to press upon me, press upon me, press upon me. And finally I'd get to the point where I would break down and I would say, Lord, if that's what you want me to do, I'll do it. And God would say, never mind. I went through this process about eight or ten times over a two-year period and I'd gotten to the point to where I was tired of playing the game. It was almost a cat and mouse game where if I asked Patsy to fix me a sandwich and brought me the exact same, I said, I don't want that. It, it become a very cat and mouse game where part of me in the very few times, the first few times, I almost hated God. Because when he would ask me to do something, I would go through the misery of fighting him over a period of time. I would finally agree to do it, and God would say, no, just hold off. And then for a weekend, maybe a week, I wouldn't hear nothing. And I would think, maybe it was a bad pickle that I eat. Maybe, maybe I wanted to and just don't want to admit it. But then the, the pressure would start building again, and then we would go through this whole cycle. But I noticed afterwards that about halfway through it, about two, a year into it, that my timing becomes shorter for me giving in to God. And I noticed that God's relief from me as saying yes was shorter. It seemed like I would say yes. He would say no, hold on. And then instead of a week or a weekend, it would just be hours. God would start on me again. And when I finally come to the point that I stood up in church one Sunday morning on this side with snot and tears and bitter bellowing because I had run as far as I could run. It almost cost me my marriage. It almost cost me bankruptcy. My kids all hated me because I was a miserable human being for not being in the will of God. And when I stood up that morning and I announced that God had called me to preach, the church erupted in shouting and clapping hands because they knew what I was going through, but nobody spoke to me and gave me any confirmation through it. I felt like even to the very point that God was pushing me towards something and once I agreed to it, He just abandoned me. And then it would start again and abandon me. Again and then abandon me. Lord knows when Patsy and I first got married, He led me to marry her in the first two years, I thought He abandoned me. He abandoned her too. Those first two years are rough sometimes. But as God led me this week, as I read this scripture and He led me to this scripture, Isaiah said, God, you don't even esteem me. 
He said, you don't even, you don't even look at me. And he said, what I want, he said, you just passed over me like I don't even matter. And God said this. He said, it's me that gives you the strength. And I don't have time to preach this message. We're having communion, and y'all got Sunday school. Oh, I wish I did. But I want to answer a question that you may have had or you may have dealt with in the past or some of you are dealing with right now that it's hard to understand. It's hard for me to understand. It's at the most pivotal times in our life when we think that God has abandoned us is when God is ready to use us more than He ever has. It's a huge turning point. Let me give you a reference. There was a man one time in the New Testament and he made this statement. You listening? He said, My Lord and my God, why hast thou forsaken me? <laughs> Never thought about that, did you? Isaiah said, Why have you passed over me? God, I'm willing to do anything you want me to do, but it seemed like you just shoved me in a closet. Jesus said, Lord, I've done everything you've asked me to do. I've walked among them. He said, I've dealt with them. I've ate with the worst sinners that's ever been. He said, I've stood in front of the council. I've taken the beating. I've taken the ones that I healed that said that I was healed by, Be they healed, were healed by Beelzebub. I've taken my best friend stabbing me back in my back and lying about me. And now here I am at the point of the cross. My Lord and my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Guys, that's deep. Moses led the children of Israel out. They come up to the Red Sea. God told Moses to smite the water. The water, he led them across on dry ground. Got over there. Did Moses ever see the promised land? Mm -mm. He saw it afar off, but he died. He never got to go in. So close to seeing the revelation of God that God had given them. Abraham left his family and his country, a, a true man of God, going looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. Did he ever find it? God promised Abraham that his children would be as the sand of the sea, but yet he only had one child. Well, technically two. But then God asked him to sacrifice the one he had. Let me explain why. Look, let me go a little further. And we may or may not read the Corinthian Scripture. I don't know. Paul had studied all his life he come up under Gamaliel, the greatest teacher ever known. He surpassed the greatest teacher ever known. Paul was a Jew above Jew above Jew. You could not ask Paul anything about the Jews that Paul didn't know. And Paul was eager to go about doing the will of the church. He was going and finding these gnarly Christians and putting them in jail. He was fighting for the cause. He was everything. He was that a student that made a 114 grade average that you just hated. He exceeded in everything right unto the point that God met him on the road and said, Saul, Saul, why dost thou persecutest me? And Saul said, Who are you? So with Paul, with all this experience, to preach and minister to the Jews, to convert the Jews to Christianity with every tool in the shed that he needed to minister to the Jews. Who did God send him to? The Gentiles. The very ones that he could not stand. That's who God sent him to. Don't you think it crossed Paul's mind or Saul's mind? My Lord and my God, all I've done for you and you have forsaken me. This morning I want you to understand something. And some of you is going to put a very creepy feeling on you. 
It's when we have been forsaken is when God is about to use us the most He ever has. That is hard for us to see. And and I, I promise you, I'm trying to quit using my cancer, but I can't help it. God keeps bringing it up. Several of you, when I found out I had cancer and was looking at the diagnosis and it went from a, a stage one, and I'm like, well, you know, stage one ain't that bad. They can handle that. Then it went to a stage two. I had surgery. It went to a stage two. And I'm thinking, well, stage two, I think there's only four. That, 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 that's getting kind of, kind of serious, God. And then I had another surgery, and then it went to stage three. And then it went to talking about no chemo, no radiation. And then before, when it went to stage three, it come into chemotherapy, chemotherapy and radiation, and then chemotherapy, what turned out to be the thing was going to end in surgery, but it ended up being, went from a two or three month thing to a nine month thing, to being out of work, to dealing with all the complications and all of that. And there was a point in my time to where I laid on my couch over here on Old Brig without any clothes on, with blisters, sores, sick as a dog. I couldn't hold my head up. You know what went through my mind? My Lord and my God... Where are you? Where are you? God, I preach. I teach. I witness. I walk the streets. I do things on my off day. Not that you owe me, but Lord, I've done everything that I know how to do. And here, here I am with cancer. I went in the hospital weighing 236 pounds. I come out weighing 198 12 days 30 something pounds in 12 days where is my God unbeknownst to me since then while I was taking treatment up at the cancer center I I got to where I strayed out of my little booth and ended up in other booths telling them about the grace and the mercy of God I lost some of my problems by helping others with their problems. And since then, one of the nurses come to me and said, Brother Mark, I'd give anything if we had a chaplain. We just can't afford one. And I said, well, we'll just pray God send y'all one. And then another one come and said, Brother Mark, I wish we had a chaplain up here. There's a lot could be done. And I said, well, honey, i got a full-time job, and I ain't got time to do my job. I wish we'll pray that God sends you one. You know what? God sent them one. Do you know what it is when the phone rings now and I run up on the mountain and sit down and talk with a man or a woman who thinks they're going to hell and God hates them and I'm able to talk them off of the edge of a cliff and I thank my Lord and my God thank you for forsaking me because you were preparing me for something greater than anything I could have ever been a part of I couldn't have done it by myself because when if I would have went up there and done that I wouldn't have been able to relate to them but honey I can go up there and relate to them because I've sat in the same chairs I've taken the same radiation I've had some of the same surgeries that they had and to watch them with this this ready to die, ready to commit suicide on the verge and to walk out with them sitting there with their hands raised up Praising God. What if God would have answered Christ and said, You're right, I've forsaken you, son. Let me carry you home. Then we would be talking to a room full of lost folks trying to live by the law, having no hope of an eternity with God but because God forsaken him and allowed him to be the perfect sacrifice on that rugged cross and raised him up on the third day, he said, whosoever will, let him come. 
Boy, if that don't crank your tractor this morning, I want you to know that in life, sometimes, and we're preaching on this next week if God wills us, our vision and the way we see life is totally different than the way God sees us. It's through our imperfections and sometimes it's through our downfalls that makes us strong. It's not our strength that we run on, but it's God's strength. It's when He lifts us up, He puts us down or allows us to put down only so He could lift us up that we might shine the brighter. I want you to know this morning that praise be to God, the greatest thing we could ever be done is to be used by God to let others see God in us. And that ministry happens a lot of times through us but it happens most of the time when we feel like God has forgotten who we are. It's when our greatest miracle happens in us. Let me give you an example and I'll hush. Get the band, come back up here. Women. The Bible says, do you remember that ninth month? Do you remember losing a lot of sleep? Do you remember how bad your back hurt? You couldn't sit. You couldn't stand. You couldn't walk. You were miserable. Miserable. Especially for that last month. But the joy that it brought into your life. It's a lot like that. You know, you look at your husband and go, Honey, I love you. And then that last week is like, Move. Everybody's talking about, oh, she's glowing, she's beautiful. And then it turns and they get him in here, get the doctor in here now. Not so beautiful. But when they wrap that little boy or little girl up and lay him in your arms, it's kind of like this. When we feel forsaken by God, God is fixing to birth in us. <laughs> Something brand new. So I challenge you this morning, whether you're at home or whether you're in here. Come on, guys. You're making too much noise. If you feel like God has forsaken you, you might want to look up. Because God may be trying to use you in a way that you never saw coming. How about that this morning?